Lord Jesus, we just thank you, O Lord, that we can look into your word. We thank you, O God, that your word is true, that it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Oh, how we need a light in this dark world. Oh, dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Is, isn't anything sacred? You heard that statement? You might hear it. I think I grew up hearing that. Isn't anything sacred anymore? And that's a good question. It's really not a, well, I guess it is kind of a, a rhetorical question, with, which means the answer is obvious. Um, of course, things are sacred, and, and, and we want to try to keep that, that aura, I guess you could say, about certain things. Certain things need to be respected. Certain things need to be held as sacred. And, and I think, uh, you know, there, there's certainly reason to be concerned about that. And I think one of the things that, that uh, uh, is, is under scrutiny today and questions being raised, which I don't think should be, is, is maybe the flag is an example of something that I don't know if we use the word term sacred or whatever, but, but, but the flag is certainly an example of something that is to be respected. And, and we need to learn, and we need to continue to learn to, to honor that in, in, our, in our society. And, and what we have before us today in, in John, the second chapter, John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22, I read a few extra verses. Um, in, in the scripture reading, but John chapter 2, what we have is a situation where the leaders of the, of the nation had lost the sense of sacredness or uh, lost the sense of respect and reverence for the very, the very holy place that they were, they were responsible for. Isn't that something? So in, in chapter in chapter two verse thirteen of John chapter two you'll remember if you if you have your Bibles I, <clears throat> I encourage you to to be looking down at them as as, as my sermons always attempt to to, uh, to to be very biblically based so uh, the first part of chapter two you'll you'll remember is the wedding of Cana where Jesus and his mother are, are there at the wedding of Cana. And you know what happened there about the water and the wine and, and so on and so forth. But then um, verse 12, uh, well, verse 11 says, This is the beginning of the signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and he manifested his glory, it says. And his disciples believed in him. And then verse 12, it says, After this he went down to Capernaum, he, his mother, and his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay there many days. And then verse 13 begins with our text, what, we, what was assigned to us today. And it says, Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple. And that's really the subject of our, of our message today, is, is in the temple. What is the temple? Where is your temple? Where do you go for quietness? Where do you worship? A lot of people say, "Why well, I, I worship down at the down at the dock. I worship at the fishing hole or in the or in the deer stand." And that is that is absolutely a good place to worship. Um, but it's not a good place to worship in place of coming here on Sunday morning. But it is a very good place to worship and to find God on, on every other time, every other day of the week. And, and I've heard hunters, fellow hunters, when back when I was hunting a lot more than I do now, they say, well, I, I worship on the deer stand. And I said, well, uh, that's why I'm not there on Sunday morning. And I said, well, well, good. Leave your gun in the truck and bring your Bible and your hymnal out into the deer stand. <laughs> then you can truly worship because that's what we're commanded and called to do. The many imperatives that Jesus has given in the Bible about, uh, about how we are to worship. Um, but we need to be honest about these things. And, 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 but, I, but I do recognize a lot of sermons, the 
been written in the deer stand uh, from my hand there. Well, when we think about the temple, many of you uh, maybe are not real, real familiar about the temple. This is the third temple, a little background and review. This is, according to scholars, the third temple. Solomon, David's son, the second king of Israel, or the third king of Israel, actually, built the first temple in approximately 966 B.C. It was destroyed in 586 by the Babylonians. That's another story. It's a long story. The second temple was built by the returning captives released from captivity around 506 B.C. So they were, they were in captivity and the temple was, was just a pile of rubble for about 70 years. Now the first temple, of course, was very, very beautiful. The second temple was a mere shadow of the first. Comparatively, it'd be like if, if this church were, were not here and we were rebuilding something and we rebuilt it with, with just, just stones and branches and whatnot. That's, that's basically the comparison between the first and the second one. But somehow the second one survived up until 20 B.C. when King Herod, not even a Jew, well, I don't think Herod was a Jew, began rebuilding it again around 20 B.C., so that's the, the third temple. And this was the temple where we find our story today. This is taking place in the third temple. It is interesting, and it pertains to this story, that when Solomon built the first temple, and I have forgotten this, but in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7, it specifies that no tool was to be used on the job site. There was to be no noise in the, in the construction of that first temple. So everything was manufactured, a lot of it, like a lot of manufacturing is today, was prefabricated off-site and, and, and then basically assembled on, on the job site so that there was a minimal of noise. Isn't that something? And, and, and again, that's 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7, where it talks about that. Well, back to Herod's temple, now this current temple that Jesus is in here. The third temple was even larger and quite elaborate. If you, just an interesting thing, don't do it now, but, but when you get home, just uh, look at, there's, there's some YouTube videos about the temple, and, it, and it, of course they're not real, they're, they're kind of 3D animation type Type videos, but they're really interesting, giving you some insight into what what these things uh, supposed were supposed to look like. The the third temple, continuing on this history, was destroyed by the Romans about forty years after Jesus was here, or was was on the earth about seventy A.D. exactly as prophesied. And and I and I just point that out again. You know, as I was teaching the kids, the contramans about prophecy. Bible prophecy is always 100% accurate. And there are many, many prophecies in the Bible that were fulfilled when Jesus came the first time, and there are many prophecies that are waiting to be fulfilled when Jesus comes the second time. But anyway, Jesus told the disciples on Mount Olivet, he said, not one stone will be left upon another. And so when the Romans came and 40 years later in 70 A.D., they burned the temple. And what happened was all the gold, and this is what I read, I had never read this before, all the gold and so on melted down into the cracks, you know, due to the fire and the heat. And so the Romans, the soldiers, as they were scavenging, trying to go after that gold, that's why they tore it from every stone from another. Isn't that interesting? And hence, isn't that interesting? The fulfillment of Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Oh, the word, the powerful word of God. And there are many prophecies, my dear friend, for the future of Jesus' soon return and exactly how it's going to happen. And it's going to be fulfilled exactly as he said. There is a fourth temple that is believed to be and predicted and, and some, some thought, 
some, some, some scholars believe that it will be built according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, and, and the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. This fourth temple is yet to be built, but, but we're not exactly sure, or their scholars aren't exactly sure if it's going to be built or not. But our text here is, is Jesus coming into this temple. And it says, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Of course, everything is up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is high on, on, on a high elevation. The, the city itself is, is, is pretty high in elevation. I don't know off the top of my head exactly what it is. And it says, and he found the temple in the and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. Doing business in the temple. And it says, and he made a whip out of cords, and he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxygen uh, oxygen and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overturned the temples. Yeah, there was probably a shortage of oxygen there too, probably. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. <laughs> this is the first of the two times that Jesus cleansed the temple. You'll remember that Jesus did it during Holy Week as well at the other end of his ministry, but this is the beginning. Lenski, the, the commentator, uh, says this is the first Passover of Jesus' ministry. Every male 12 years old and up is supposed to be here. And his first great public act, the wedding at Cana was more or less a private somewhat, it wasn't a public, but his first great public act would take place in the capital, in the temple, itself. Isn't that amazing? And of course we'll see what, what, what he talks about. But in verse 19 of our text it says, Jesus answered them as far as the religious leaders when they asked him, what in the world are you doing? Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Well first of all we see, we see the, the description of what's taking place there in verses 13 and 14. You look at that in your Bible. And uh, Jesus went up to Jerusalem, it was the Passover, it was an annual event, an annual celebration, recognizing the, 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 the deliverance of the, of the Israelites from, from the hand of bondage in Egypt. And he found in the temple, and he, as we said, the oxen, the sheep, the doves, the money changers doing business. The priests and the leaders made the temple literally an emporium. You wonder where that word emporium comes from. You, see, you used to see that word. I don't think it's used that much anymore. But the word emporium. What, what was an emporium? An emporium was, was a place of merchandise. And that is the Greek word that is used here. They, they made the temple an emporium. Why? Because of, you see that word there when it talks about the coins. The overturned the tables of the money changers in verse verse 15. And, and, and what it talked about there is the little coins. There was little coins here, and that's that's kind of what, what this, this text boils down to. It's so easy to lose the sense of the sacred and reverent fear of God, and in its place worry about little coins. Are we worried? about little coins. Are we worried about little coins? Is, is, there, is there an issue of, of little coins in churches today? I remember in the, the church that I did an internship that the, 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 the church was short of funds. It had, they, 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 they didn't have enough, enough people coming and so they had ovens in the church basement and the women of the church would make pasties. I don't even know what a pasty is or a pasty. It's a kind of a Finnish type sandwich. It's some, some sort of thing. And they had a business going on out of the church kitchen. And I remember when I went there as an intern, I walked in there and here's this, this commercial oven. It's got all these doors that open up and you could, you could make all kinds of, just bake all day long and all kinds of these things, which they used that for part of their, their fundraising to pay the bills in the church. 
And the pastor was known as the pasty pastor. <laughs> Little coins. And you know, how in the world did these guys get permission to bring their animals into the court of the Gentiles in this temple? They could have only come as because the leaders gave them permission. And why did they give them permission? It had to have been because of these little coins. All oh, the little coins that can ruin a ministry. And here, that's, it. That's, that's what it's all about here to the religious leaders. And that's why they have changed the house of God into a house of merchandise. And that's what it was all about, is these little coins. And Jesus comes in there, and of course the manifestation of that was the, was the emporium of what the church had become. The church had just become an emporium. And I wonder how many churches today are churches that are just emporiums. We have forgotten what it's like to be a place of reverence for Almighty God. The whole point of the church had changed, and that's why Jesus did what he did. He disrupted the whole thing in, in verses 15 and 16. He made a whip out of cord and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured the changers' money and overturned their tables and got rid of those little coins as they scattered all over the, all over the pavement. You can just see that and picture that in it. And it's depicted in any number of, of half a dozen or so movies today. As we, we have so many, so many wonderful things today. We can, we can just watch it all on film. And it's probably very, very accurate. And he said to those who sold the doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. And notice my father's house here. And, and I, I just draw your attention to John 14, when it says, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. And he's referring to heaven. Thirdly, the discussion, Paul teaches us that our body is a temple. We've been talking about the four temples or the, or the three temples in Scripture. But did you know that your body is a temple according to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3? In 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us that this, he teaches this, not far from our scripture reading, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you? You are a temple, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, just a few chapters later, 6, 19, it says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You are the temple, folks, and if you are a believer in Christ, you are not your own. You are not your own. Your body was bought at a price. You are, you, you, it's like, it's, it, I hate to say this in this way because slavery is such a big issue today, but it's like we were bought on a slave market. You are not your own if you're a Christian. You're not your own. What does that mean? You do not have sovereign control over your life. You cannot make a decision without, with, right, rightly without, without talking to God first. You cannot do whatever you want to do. You are, by, by rights, by possession, by purchase, you belong to Jesus Christ. You and I belong to Jesus Christ, and we have no right whatsoever to, to make sovereign decisions about our own bodies. According to 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God's in God's of course, God's singular, God's as a possessional, which are God's by possession. Well, that's a discussion about the temple. And of course, we, we see in, in uh, the simple message of the temple needs cleansing so men and women can worship God without being taken advantage of through manipulation for gain. But the higher message, as, as Lenski again says, is the great Paschal Lamb, of whom the Baptist had testified, attends to the great Paschal Feast 
and therefore tells his own death and sacrifice. See, that's what Jesus does here in this passage, is that he foretells his sacrifice. He says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. See, Jesus is the true sanctuary and temple, torn down on the cross, but rebuilt himself in three days, destroyed this temple. And it's interesting to note here, and I thought I wrote this down, yeah, in Matthew 26, 61, that that very statement is the one that the false, false uh, prop or false witnesses brought against him at his crucifixion trial. And they said, this, this deceiver said that he would destroy this temple in three days and rebuild it. It says in, in verse 61, this fellow said, I am able to destroy this temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Which was absolutely true. But he was speaking of his body. Well, I'm thankful for the person of Jesus Christ and what he does. You know, the Bible tells us in Revelation that there is no temple in heaven. Because it says the Lord God and the Lamb are the temple. Revelation 21, 22. You know, sadly, there was too much of a connection between the temple and the little coins. And maybe that's the case in so many churches today. And I, and I, I, I don't think it's a problem here. Thank God for you people. We thank God, but, but we always need to remain vigilant. And realize that the temple didn't get this way overnight. It was the leadership of the temple that allowed the animals to be brought in, allowed the money changers to come in, and allowed the attitudes to change from worship of God to worship of money. The little coins might be necessary, but by no means are they the ultimate goal and the ultimate purpose. But Jesus himself is the temple and the light that we need to follow. He says, destroy this temple, and he will raise it up in three days. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, O God, for your word. We thank you for the privilege of hearing your word once again. And dear God, we pray that you would continue to speak to us, Lord, as we go into our communion service. In Jesus' name, amen.